Welcome to episode and the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane and I'm here today with my co-host Felix Lutsch. And today we're going to speak with Yong Lee. He's the founder of Crescent Network. Crescent is a decentralized exchange, uh, AMM order book exchange on Cosmos, a uh, very innovative project. So we're really excited to speak with him. Uh, about that. Now, before we get into uh, Crescent, we just wanted to briefly talk about our sponsor this week. So uh, our sponsor is Omni. Omni is, you know, your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet that puts the power of Web3 at your fingertips. You know, in just three taps, you can stake and manage your assets in over 22 built-in protocols, including all the EVMs, all the major EVMs, L2s, and also non-EVM chains like Cosmos, Solana, Near, and more. Uh, Omni abstracts away the complexity, but re retains, you know, that it's fully self-custodial and makes it really easy for you to get yield on your crypto. Uh, they also have multi-chain NFT support, so you can view all your NFTs in one place and you can show your nicest NFT as an app background. So. And in, in, they have an explore section in the app where you can, you know, see new apps, uh, new yield opportunities, uh, and, and news. And, uh, yeah. So if you want to check it out, uh, you can get it on iOS or Android. Just look for Omni Wallet. That's O M N I Wallet. Or you can go to the website, omni.fi. And yeah, with that, Jung, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it is great to be here. Yeah, so we we have known Jung for for quite a while, uh, and I, I I guess the the thing I remember especially was that uh, in that was I guess two thousand nineteen there was the uh, middle conference in South Korea and there was the the Cosmos Hackathon there. And, you know, with, with course one, we were participating there and we were actually working together with Jung and, uh, and his colleague. And we were working on some uh, Cosmos liquid staking uh, stuff, uh, for the hackathon. So I think that was very fun to work together. So we've known Jung since then, spent a bunch of time there. We were very impressed with his, um, especially understanding of DeFi and of, of sort of liquidity markets incentives uh financial instruments so it's yeah it's great to finally come uh, on epicenter and talk a bit about some of the work you've done since then yes oh uh, yeah uh, happy to be finally uh be in this uh, epicenter uh talking about things so yeah uh especially from myself like personally like meeting these uh, like OG people uh, way back in like 2018 and 19, it feels really good and 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 it feels like family. So I, I'm very happy to uh, touch with you guys again and and hopefully we, we can see each other soon uh, in Cosmoverse also. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about your background how did you get into crypto and how did you get into the cosmos ecosystem in particular yeah so uh i majored in mathematics in undergraduate and then i studied some uh global finance in and in master and i worked as a market maker and arbitrage trader in investment bank in korea and for about uh, 10 years uh and then i i i'm trying to uh have another chance to participate in this like new move of technology, including like AI and blockchain and other uh, stuff. Uh, because from my nature, we I, I was like finding something uh, more innovative and more uh, transparent and more decentralized uh, technology uh, with uh, a lot of uh, new philosophy, like uh, uh, not very conservative. Uh, so. Uh, uh, from my uh, uh, older um, uh, job, uh, that was like very conservative uh, environment with very um, uh, power and um, money game within, and it was 
quite boring. And uh, I wanted to have another chance to uh, bring this uh, again in my life to like get another energy to move on. And and the blockchain just uh, caught my eyes. So like at first, like 2018, I was like deep into the Ethereum ecosystem, trying to build some financial uh, application from it. And I was trying that like for three months. And then uh, finally, I, I had made a transaction like costing like uh, millions of dollars. And I, I thought that it was impossible. So I tried to uh, find another uh uh, projects and that was like Cosmos and I, I just like caught up with this like uh, big vision uh, millions of blockchain and connected each other uh, and I just uh, believed it in one side and then just like keep uh, doing this for more than four years as now so uh, uh, that was like my uh, history how to get into uh, Cosmos uh, ecosystem yeah super interesting and then i think you started out basically as a validator as many in the cosmos ecosystem maybe you can talk a little bit about how how you made that choice to start there and then how you kind of moved to to the to the dex space or, or what you're what you're building today yeah yeah so uh at that time like pos is even not very uh universal in in the space like everything was ethereum uh and erc20 and a smart contract so uh it was very new in the blockchain area so like i i was trying to uh, understand and uh get some experience and knowledge on this like the pos uh environment uh and also uh studying deeply more about Cosmos SDK and Tendermint uh, consensus layer so that we can fully understand and utilize this for a new application layer. So like we started with validator uh, participating in testnet for about, I think it was about like nine months uh, until mainnet launch in, in 2019. Uh, and then started our validator business uh, with uh, participating in different projects. While that, uh, we were like uh, one of the validator who are like deeply reading the uh, blockchain core uh, code bases, like including like Kava or Terra or other uh, uh, earlier projects in Cosmos. Uh, even we were participating in several uh, projects with as an auditor. Uh, so we write wrote some like report on these financial applications. Uh, so uh, uh, from this like uh, knowledge and experience, we started to build our own uh, capability to understand and innovate this uh, DeFi space. So we started to participate in other activities uh, like working with Tendermint uh, Corporation and also ICF to build some uh, modules and features for Tendermint and Cosmos SDK. So one of the results was uh, Gravity Dex uh, operated on Cosmos Hub uh, with uh, AMM and Audible at the same time. So uh, this is like one of the information who people doesn't know uh, is that uh, be because the, the UI uh, was um, Emeris and the Emeris that didn't provide uh, Audible UI. But actually the, in the code base, uh, Audible is already there. Uh, in 2021, uh, it, that was like hybrid DEX uh, from beginning. Uh, original design was hybrid DEX. So, uh, but we didn't allow, we enabled it uh, because it, it is uh, too experimental for Cosmos Up. Uh, so that was our start uh, to build this, uh, one of the DeFi uh, application, which is like DEX with AMM and Audible at the same time. So that was our uh, first uh, big move into this uh, DeFi space. I think there, there's definitely a lot we want to go into there with this like order book, uh, AMMs, but maybe just talking a little bit more about the, so, you know, gravity was, was on the Cosmos app. Can you talk a bit like, you know, what happened and like, how did it evolve or result in, you know, you then launching Crescent on its own chain? Yeah, so uh, as a like a big time uh, believer in Cosmos and Atom, we we 
we were trying to uh, persuade the community to uh, have a DEX in Cosmos Hub uh, and incentivize from atom inflation. Uh, so that was our uh, purpose to uh, persuade the community uh, with this, uh, because uh, for any DEX, uh, especially with AMM formation, uh, uh, liquidity incentive is the core part of the uh, functionality. Uh, so we believe that there should be some incentive coming from Cosmos Up, and that was uh, Adam because uh, uh, the community doesn't allow to mint another token in Cosmos Up. So that was only uh, Atom is the only option. So we are trying to uh, persuade the uh, inner community in Cosmos Up. Uh, trying to uh, uh, persuade uh, to use this uh, atom inflation for this uh, important utility. Uh, but there were some uh, um, objection with like uh, hub minimalism uh, and supporting this like new projects in, in Cosmos ecosystem, um, not by interfering this uh, business with uh, from this Cosmos hub, uh, like uh, taking all the uh, market share. So uh, we, we thought out about it and we also discussed out of, about it with a lot of people and we decided uh, not to per, uh, pursue that uh, because uh, uh, eventually without, without the DEX in Cosmos up, there will be lots of DEX in Cosmos, uh, which is already happening right now. Uh, so that will be more resilient future for the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, having a lot of DEXs with different characteristics and advantages. Uh, so uh, we uh, decided not to have this incentive uh, for uh, Gravity DEX. And finally, we decided to migrate this uh, Gravity DEX into our own chain uh, so that we can uh, uh, proceed with all the innovation and uh, uh, features we want to build upon. So uh, that was the history for the decision making. Awesome. Yeah, I think before we get into like the features and what you're working on with Crescent, maybe one thing that would be interesting, we we just earlier looked a little bit in the UI, looked at the governance proposals, and uh, the very first one is about the, the Crescent ethos, which, which I found very cool that you make like a voting to, to kind of um, approve the the ethos you guys have and and um maybe that would be interesting if you could tell us a little bit you know what's the what's the vision uh what are you trying to achieve with crescent yeah so uh i think uh decentralized governance is hard problem there's no like absolute answer to this uh because we we don't see any uh future yet uh, there will be like lots of different uh, approaches to have this like uh, uh, robust uh, decentralized community and uh, decision making process. So uh, we believe that there should be some uh, balanced approach for this governance. There should be some uh, strong leadership from these uh, project uh, builders. And then there will be another uh, decentralization factor from community and token holders. So I think there should be a great balance uh, between this decentralization and leadership. So uh, that is why we uh, uh, post this uh, ethos because uh, we, we want to have uh, some amount of leadership from our team, but uh, also I want, we wanted to uh, want to for the community to understand our uh, direction and our vision, uh, which is, will be very important for all this governance decision making process. So uh, that is why we write this as a, a own chain uh, governance so that everyone can transparently see uh, how we think about the future of Crescent and can be a, a reasoning uh, background for all these other uh, detailed governance proposal we are making. So uh, what we have in plan is that we are going to uh, write uh, several uh, ethos uh, in coming months uh, so that uh, we can write in detail about all the different topics uh, and also uh, uh, write about all the uh, changes in environment and 
changes in our uh, vision and roadmap and directions so that we can uh, like keep communicating with the community and write down all of this evidence in on chain so that we can uh, uh, make a better trust uh, from this community. Um, but but maybe looking uh, looking at it a little bit differently or more generally, like if you think sort of in the long run, you know, if Crescent really succeeds, what do you think the role of Crescent would be? You know, in in the crypto ecosystem, like what what does it look like? You know, Crescent in like you know ten years when it has like worked out amazingly well. So I think there should be uh, several roles we hope to take in Cosmos ecosystem, but like more most Im imminent uh, role will be uh, liquidity formation for new projects. So uh, currently. There are lots of new projects coming into Cosmos. Like within a year, I expect there will be like 50 to 100 uh, pro new projects will come to Cosmos ecosystem and they all need uh, liquidity for their tokens and other tokens uh, they are creating, such as stable coins and liquid staking tokens and other stuff. So uh, we believe that it is very hard job for us to have all of this liquidity in the ecosystem. And there should be a, a better way, smart way, and efficient way uh, to provide this uh, liquidity formation uh, with, uh, with sustainable uh, methodology. So uh, we believe that Crescent is one of the team uh, who can uh, do this role uh, at best. So uh, we are uh, do, do our best to uh, take this role for Cosmos ecosystem. When when you say liquidity formation, do you have do you have in mind you know like crowdfunding? So basically, a project wants to raise money and you know sell some token to the market, or, or like just that there's like you know liquid markets for uh, for these tokens, so that you know people can sell them and buy them, or or, or you mean I guess uh, mix of both or. What do you think is the most important aspect to liquidity formation? So I think uh, fundraising uh, and uh, liquidity formation is a little bit different topic, which can be a little bit uh, related. Uh, but I think our role will be more on this uh, liquidity formation. But still, uh, uh, from this uh, process of liquidity formation, there can be a, like uh, additional token sale approach, uh, so which is called like IDO. So I think uh, that can be another role uh, Crescent uh, can take, uh, but it, in more like a connection to the liquidity formation process. So liquidity formation is more like an ongoing liquidity so that uh, any token holders can uh, buy or sell this token uh, at any time. Uh, this is completely different from fundraising because fundraising only allows you to buy this token within specific time period. Uh, so liquidity will be more like a continuous uh, liquidity for users to trade uh, anytime they want. All right, cool. Yeah, I, I think that leads us into the meat of the discussion where I think you already mentioned a bit that uh, Gravity Dex and I think also Crescent basically has this hybrid AMM order book approach. Uh, maybe for the listeners, or also because it would be great to hear you talk about it, uh, can you compare kind of what's, what is the difference maybe also between AMM and the order book and what, what are the advantages or the disadvantages of, of either of them and, and how, how you chose to combine them in the end to, to create a better product? Yes, uh, so uh, we saw all this innovation coming in in 2020 uh, with uh, Uniswap and other uh, DEXs to come, like Curve Finance and Balancer. Uh, and we believe that there is some area uh, where uh, AMM was uh, popular in Ethereum ecosystem with very certain reasons, uh, including like um, listing was uh, like a power game within a uh, centralized exchange. Uh, and also like gas fee is too expensive for uh, DEX, uh, DEXs to provide uh, order book utility 
So that was like a uh, more centralized order book DEX was there uh, before that, but it was not very successful because it was too centralized uh, and gas fee doesn't allow Ethereum ecosystem to build uh, 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 order book DEX. So uh, there was some reason for AMM and there was some reason why order book DEX was not successful in e Ethereum. And I saw all of this like story of uh, e evolving this DEX uh, feature and uh, utility. And we, we saw that uh, actually in Cosmos, there's no reason to uh, uh, ignore this uh, great utility, which is order book DEX. But still, AMM provides a great way to form initial liquidity uh, because like uh, market makers will have a lot of uh, hard time uh, making this market because of this uh, huge risk of uh, uh, inventory management uh, for these unhedgeable uh, tokens. So I think there will be like some uh, equilibrium point where in some circumstances AMM can do better and in some uh, circumstances uh, Audible can do better. So uh, why not take all of this advantage in one uh, marketplace? So that was like very obvious uh, 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 conclusion from our team to build this from start. So when we build this Gravity Dex, most uh, easiest uh, solution will be just building this AMM, like copying Uniswap version two. That was like easy uh, conclusion, but we didn't do that because we saw uh, obviously order book will be the uh, better uh, approach in Cosmos. So uh, we did, uh, instead of uh, building uh, basic AMM, we built uh, a hybrid X from start. Uh, so now we are doing our best uh, to uh, uh, take these advantages from these two different features at the same time. So I think like utility is not the uh, all uh, for our uh, project to success uh, because uh, we need like uh, uh, accompanied uh, business effort, uh, partnership and market maker incentive and uh, LP incentive uh, plans and strategy. All these things come together to make the uh, project successful. So we are trying to uh, do that right now, uh, doing more business and doing more partnership so that we can bring more uh, users and partners and tokens uh, within the Crescent uh, DEX. So can you explain, like, how do you, how do you combine, how do you make a hybrid DEX? Uh, like, how do those two um, sort of interact with each other? So this is uh, more like how you see AMM. So uh, if you see AMM as a standalone innovation uh, from nowhere, then it is very difficult to uh, understand AMM in a concept of uh, order book. But if you see everything within order book uh, perspective, and AMM, you can, you can see that AMM is restricted version of order book with very restricted freedom for market makers and traders. So traders cannot do uh, limit orders, only market orders. And market makers can provide uh, liquidity uh, only following this uh, constant product model uh, formula. So this is like a very small subset of order book. Uh, this is, uh, so uh, uh, when you see this uh, space uh, of freedom for this design for the DEX, then uh, it is very uh, clear to understand that AMM is a subset of order book. So uh, when you see this uh, way, then combining these two is much easier because you can see AMM as order book uh, and order book feature. And then we build everything based on order book. And then we uh, uh, place this AMM on order book uh, base ground. Uh, so uh, what we did is uh, to describe this AMM liquidity into multiple limit orders on order book uh, so that we can calculate each uh, amount in each tick of the orders, uh, uh, which is uh, completely perfectly following the 
constant product model, then we can derive exact number of amount uh, for each tick. Uh, so we just place all of them within the order book and every orders coming from users and liquidity pools, they are matching each other without any prioritization or special treatment. They just uh, act as another limit order and they just meet each other with uh, the order book uh, matching system. Another um, special thing about uh, Crescent X is that uh, we use uh, batch uh, execution, which uh, prevent uh, MEV from start. So uh, this uh, batch execution is uh, uh, matching this order each other uh, without any time prioritization within a block. So uh, if there's a, uh, multiple orders in one block uh, with different uh, sorting, but still uh, there's no prioritization of order matching uh, within what block. So it doesn't matter at all. So like, uh, like Skip Protocol is doing MEV solution, uh, like providing uh, ways for traders to uh, lobbying the validator to uh, make their transaction at top of the block, uh, but still uh, either you, your uh, transaction at the top or bottom, uh, the result will be exactly the same. So there's no uh, need for MEV at all uh, because there's no difference. So uh, this is another uh, characteristic we have in our DEX. So um, I guess, yeah, we definitely want to go a bit into that since that seems to be a very important feature, obviously, of uh, of um, Crescent. I think um, when, you, when you say it like that, basically there is one, within a block, there's one clearing price then for the different orders and you would have... Maybe you know you have three orders and and they would all get the average price uh, in the end. Is that how it works? Am I understanding correctly? Oh, actually, we have two ways to uh, match each other with batch execution. Still, in batch execution, there can be like multiple uh, sub price within the batching. And 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 in our first design in Gravity Dex. That was we used uh, our uh, universal shop price uh, model, which is uh, what we de you described. Um, we have only one shop price for every matched pair of uh, orders. Uh, but now we upgraded our uh, decks to have a more matching uh, within a block. Uh, we need to allow uh, multiple shop price matching uh, price. Uh, for each uh, block. So now we have uh, like multiple uh, batching uh, price within a block, uh, but still we don't have any time prioritization, only price prioritization. So we, we pursue more optimization, uh, but still we keep our uh, fairness of trading uh, for this uh, like sorting of orders within a block. So with the AMMs, right, the, I guess also there, there's been a lot of, you know, movement, how this works, right? Because the, the traditional model had probably, you know, the significant number of listeners are familiar with is, you know, you have some pool, maybe it's, I don't know, if to die, and then uh, as a as a liquidity provider, I can just put in if and die, you know, in equal proportions into this pool, and then you know I get some trading fees based on you know the people trading, and and then when the price changes, right, then kind of uh, sort of it, it will sell, you know, maybe if and buy die or the other way around. So you have this impermanent loss to deal with, uh, but but of course the nice thing is as a user. As a liquidity provider, I don't have to think about, I mean, I, the decision's very easy, right? I just put money in there. Everybody puts money in there. It doesn't really make a difference. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, maybe where the sophistication does come in is understanding the risk you're taking, understanding the impermanent loss and how to deal with that. Cause that's not so simple. And that I think is very confusing for people as well. But of course we already have with Uniswap V3 uh basically 
you know, a big change where I think I can be like, okay, I'm going to put money into this pool, but now I'm going to specify that, you know, I'm, I'm concentrating this liquidity on a certain price range. And of course that already goes a little bit in this hybrid direction, you know, because uh, it's, it's now all of a sudden that decision is an important decision. You know, where do you concentrate this liquidity? If you, you know, you concentrate it in the wrong place, maybe your liquidity doesn't get used and you just don't earn any fees uh, or maybe otherwise you take more risk. So already is something that I think as a normal user, you don't really know how to deal with this stuff, right? That's a normal liquidity provider. Um, so what, how, how do you see AMMs in the future? Like, how how do you think they will evolve? Oh yeah, I, I just want to like share some uh, uh, situation in Ethereum first because like uh, obviously like DeFi is in Ethereum is like heading uh, uh, to the future, uh, so we can expect the future of Cosmos by like researching this Ethereum ecosystem. So. Uh, like one year ago, uh, Uniswap version three launched, uh, and now if you can see the liquidity, the uh, version two liquidity is almost uh, like done right now. There is no much liquidity left, and uh, all the liquidity is uh, coming from version three. And if you see this liquidity formation within uh, all these pairs, uh, you can see that this liquidity is like very dynamically moving. Uh, so this is more like a, a very sophisticated uh, strategy for a uh, liquidity provider to uh, provide this liquidity uh, with very frequent uh, rebalancing of the position uh, and like more, more uh, proactive uh, liquidity providing methodology. So uh, I think that uh, uh, even uh, within this uh, situation, we also heard that uh, SushiSub is launching also the same thing. Uh, which is called Trident, uh, which will be coming uh, uh, very soon. Uh, and I think like uh, in SushiSwap also like uh, this like new feature will dominate all the liquidity because obviously it is more capital efficient. Uh, but like uh, difficulties it is not the uh, reason for avoidance. Uh, uh, even all the difficult solution can be utilized by smart people and this can be a better solution if it is more capital efficient. But uh, uh, exactly, uh, directly, uh, the retail users cannot use it, or if you use it, uh, then it will be very difficult to manage. So that is also another fact. So uh, what, what will be the solution? And, and just, just briefly, you say, so when you say capital efficient, what you mean is basically that uh, let's say somebody wants to go and they want to trade, then, uh, you know, one, one way to measure it, I get is, is sort of the slippage of like, you know, how much does your trade, does your price move, uh, away from the current market price where, you know, a certain amount of money, let's say you're trading $10,000 worth that, and, and then it, it, would you define like the capital efficiency that, you know, Uniswap V3, you will need a much smaller amount of capital in this pool to basically provide the same kind of, you know, price for somebody trading $10,000 than in like Uniswap V3, uh, V2, something like that. So I think we should define the, the word liquidity. So the liquidity is not TVL. That's for sure. So uh, that was like one of the biggest uh, misunderstanding in uh, DeFi space and DEX area. Everyone is watching for TVL in DeFi Llama or like DeFi Pulse and other uh, uh, dashboards uh, having like TVL 1 billion, great. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't like prove all this uh, utility because the liquidity and TVL is completely different within this like modern DeFi world. Uh, so uh, like uh, this is uh, liquidity should be defined as like uh, when, you, when you want to uh, trade a token, 
without moving the price more than 1% or 2% and then how much amount you can trade. So that is like uh, in coin market cap, you can see uh, a liquidity plus minus 2%. So this is like very basic approach to uh, measure this liquidity uh, because it, uh, it uh, calculates all the amount of liquidity you can consume uh, immediately uh, within this price range. So this should be more like a measurement for the liquidity. Uh, so uh, from this point, uh, having same liquidity from smaller TVL means uh, capital efficiency. So we talked a lot about like liquidity provisioning now. Um, we also mentioned market makers. Can you maybe kind of uh, detail what is the difference between a market maker and a liquidity provider? And maybe what's the role of the market makers in, in Crescent? Yeah, so uh, because we are hybrid decks with AMM and Odobook at the same time, uh, we we uh, it is very important for us to syn syn make a synergy with these two different approaches. So uh, AMM provides uh, more uh, robust uh, liquidity. Uh, uh, also, uh, in a micro sense, uh, a liquidity pool provides better liquidity uh, in a very narrow uh, price range, uh, which is like uh, narrower than 0.2% or something. Uh, so if you are swapping very small amount, uh, then uh, it will be very efficient to use this liquidity from AMM because like AMM is providing liquidity uh, exactly from current price uh, to uh, very near near the current price. But this order book a uh, market maker will provide liquidity uh, not very near the current price. It will be uh, distanced uh, from current price for about like 0.1% to 0.5%. For the more volatile token, it will be like 1%. So uh, there are some different aspects of liquidity provided within this micro liquidity area, uh, different uh, distribution of liquidity and this different characteristic also. So when you trade in uh, AMM, if you trade one time and then the price will move, and then it will not come back until arbitrator trade back. So if you trade again, the, and the price will be worse because you already moved the price. So uh, this is like inefficiency of AMM. But for the order book market maker, the market maker will provide the price. And then if you consume it, and they will replace the order again within, with it at this uh, exactly same price again. You can consume it again. So I, I call this rechargeable liquidity. Uh, uh, this is not the case in LP, but the market maker can do this because they can hedge in other market. So uh, this, these are like very different characteristics for these two different liquidity. And there should be a good way for our community and governance to decide uh, and calculate the uh, co contribution of liquidity coming from different methodology and, and uh, measure this uh, uh, support uh, of liquidity from different methodology. And we need to like distribute our incentive uh, wisely uh, so that we can uh, create this like very healthy competition between LP and order book market makers uh, so that we can optimize this uh, capital efficient uh, liquidity providing uh, incentives. So probably a good amount of our listeners, you know, have actually provided a, a liquidity before, you know, whether that was on Uniswap, Curve, Sushi Swap, or, you know, like Osmosis, very popular, also on Crescent, right? Like, so there's like many different places where people, you know, have kind of your know, normal people were like, okay, I can provide liquidity. What's you know what's going to happen with that? Is is the, is there a future where you know normal token holder can still uh, you know provide liquidity on these exchanges, or do you think this will all be replaced by you know professional, sophisticated market makers that 
you know, can just uh, play this play this new game that's arising. So I think great thing about blockchain ecosystem is that everything, every different protocols can be connected each other without any trust assumption or uh, uh, verification assumption. So uh, everything can be connected uh, very well uh, uh, with this uh, code base only. So uh, if we can trust this algorithm, then everything can be connected very well. So I believe that even though the, the management of capital will be much more difficult in range liquidity, uh, concentrated liquidity world, still there will be like professional fund manager participating in this uh, capital management and like providing capital from retail investor for this fund. So which is called, uh, we are calling this uh, managed LP. So uh, managed LP is a fund uh, operated by professional uh, fund manager, uh, but invested by all these like retail investors. So uh, within this uh, minimal trust uh, within this uh, fund manager, uh, we can trust this manager to manage this uh, capital with very restricted uh, functionality uh, within this decentralized uh, tokenized fund. So I think uh, the future will be more like a ranged LP fund uh, operated by professionals, uh, but invested by retails. Uh, so uh, one of the example is uh, called Arakis in Ethereum, uh, which is providing uh, this uh, platform for users. So this fund manager has very restricted freedom about how to manage this fund. Uh, so it is quite uh, safe for users to invest into because they don't allow any send out all these uh, assets within the fund. Only they can do is like a minimal amount of swap or like uh, changing the range of the LP. That is the all the things uh, ma manager can do. So I think um, more of this uh, uh, functionality will be available in the uh, ecosystem. So I think uh, retail investors can participate, but the actual operation can be more uh, delegated to professionals. All right, that's cool. So we can remain being LPs in the future too. <laughs> that's good. Um, so we wanted to, I guess, maybe switch topics a bit. Now we talked a lot about kind of liquidity in the context of this DEX, of this single network. Now, obviously the Cosmos ecosystem, as you mentioned already, potentially will have like thousands of, of networks and uh, already has a lot of different DEXs. And um, yeah, maybe it would be interesting to, to hear your thoughts, how like you can aggregate liquidity across these different ecosystems and maybe at the role that Crescent plays in this story. Yes, I think uh, DEX aggregator is one of the uh, uh, interesting topic to discuss also. Uh, so uh, I think in Ethereum, uh, it is a, a transitional uh, phase right now. Uh, like one inch users are trading maybe more than Unisub front end users right now. Uh, so it's like uh, this is like a golden cross of Web2. Uh, uh, evolving to Web3. So like Web2, Web3, the definition is that when you, uh, when the traders are locked into one front end, which is Uniswap, then they cannot utilize other liquidity coming from Balancer or SushiSwap or other uh, products. So you, you are, you're jailed into one website so that your backend is also jailed too. So this is Web2 uh, in our definition. But when you use one inch, then you can uh, reach out to all these DEXs, even like very early one, because uh, you don't need any trust on this. If, if your shop is successful, then any DEX you can use because you believe in result, not the, that the service provider. So uh, one inch is more like a Web3 uh, service provider who are connecting uh, all this existing backend uh, service by one uh, front end. So uh, this is like uh, the 
change of service within Web3 uh, environment. And uh, unfortunately, in Cosmos, uh, we are in Web2. Like uh, most of the users are uh, locked in in uh, certain decks, and they are they they are uh, jailed there uh, until now. So we want to free them. So uh, when we want to free them, there should be like aggregator for Cosmos, right? Uh, and there are like several uh, projects uh, com coming in, like such as like Rango Exchange. But uh, I'm looking uh, deeply into a solution called. A squid from Axola. So uh, the problem within this Cosmos ecosystem is that all this uh, environment is uh, asynchronous uh, uh, compared to Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is uh, everything is synchronous, but in uh, Cosmos, because all this uh, application is in different blockchain, uh, the, this asynchronous uh, create problem of uh, delay and uh, latency of like uh, trade uh, execution. So uh, like, uh, especially like IBC transfer is really slow and unstable. So we need to wait like one minute or more for this one execution of uh, trade uh, with uh, IBC transfer in it. So if you use like Rango exchange, then sometimes it takes like more than a minute to complete a trade. So uh, this is not the good UX for users to experience. So uh, Axola Squid is more like uh, skipping all this IBC transfer layer by uh, utilizing liquidity layer. So liquidity layer will uh, do all this job uh, uh, for the behalf of the users and then uh, get this uh, reward back from the users after uh, the swap is completed. So uh, in this model, they can uh, erase all this like latency caused by interchain communication, but only like if 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 there's a, a block confirmation coming in once in one second in crescent, and like blo another block confirmation in uh, two second in osmosis, then you can you do this like interchain swap or uh, within two seconds, uh, like uh, routing crescent and osmosis at the same time. This is practically not possible right now because of this uh, transfer between blockchain. IBC transfer will take at least like several tens of seconds. But if you remove this, and this is like like matter of second. So uh, I think this uh, solution can bring more practical sense of uh, interchain uh, DEX aggregator uh, because it removes all the unnecessary uh, delay uh, from this. So uh, I think like IBC transfer is not uh, a dependent uh, variable for uh, liquidity relayer and interchain swap uh, functionality. So like uh, this, uh, we want to like work with them, uh, we are uh, communicate with them uh, so that we can uh, provide uh, uh, this option for, for the users. Uh, users does not know the benefit of this uh, aggregator so we want to like promote this and marketing this so that users can use uh, more of this uh, aggregator uh, for themselves because uh, your swap price will be much better than use only one dex front end so uh, within this in environment ecosystem can be more healthier because uh, the competition will be not about marketing or business or uh, front-end uh, lock-in, but more like a more efficient liquidity, more uh, more uh, cheaper trading cost and stuff. So it is uh, always good for users to have this like better, uh, healthier competition rather than like uh, spending a lot of money for marketing uh, and the like, community uh, locked in to one uh, platform. So uh, we believe this like Web3 world will open all this new environment for all these new DEXs like Kuzira, uh, say all these uh, DEXs are new, but it, it is very difficult for them to attract uh, new users. Uh, but uh, this aggregator will allow them to attract users uh, without marketing effort. Uh, so uh, this will be better for all this uh, ecosystem. 
So w one question on this, um, and, and you maybe kind of touched on it, but the um, you know one of the uh, things that if you in in the Cosmos ecosystem or in general, right, if you have things that are like cross chain, is that you know you can't make these atomic transactions that in Ethereum, right, like the way you have some some transaction that you know like automatically does different things on different chain uh different uh, you know using different smart contracts and you know everything works uh, at, at once so how do you think this is like an issue when it comes to this cross-chain dex aggregation or like how is this what are the implications of this yes uh uh, there should be some issues. Uh, so, uh, uh, relative sense, uh, Ethereum uh, ecosystem is better at aggregating everything because it is synchronous and asynchronous uh, environment will prevent some optimization for users. But still, uh, it is better than aggregating nothing. So, uh, it is more like a uh, uh, relative sense. Uh, if you can do 90% and then still 90% can be quite good. So it, 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 everything is like very statistical. So if you trade like 100 times and your trade is uh, most optimal for 90 times and that is good utility already. So uh, I think like asynchronous uh, environment can um, result in uh, non-optimal uh, uh, shopping route, but still, when you achieve this uh, for most of the time, then the DEX aggregator uh, makes a lot of sense. Cool. Does does it change anything? So you mentioned that Crescent basically gets rid of front running or MEV in the um, sense of like on the DEX with the batch batches. If we're talking about this aggregator interchain world. Does that change the equation somehow? Do you, or like, I guess, how do you generally see MEV in the interchain world uh, on a high level, maybe? Uh, so, uh, like, uh, there was some data coming from uh, Skip Protocol about the MEV uh, situation within Osmosis. So, uh, uh, they, they had about like 6 million of profit from uh, MEV trading. Uh, so I think uh, it is quite uh, large and when, when our ecosystem grow, uh, the MEV problem will be increased over time with more amount of cap uh, money uh, extracted uh, by all these like smart traders. But still, I think um, um, uh, most of the profit coming from Osmosis right now is uh, with uh, this USTC, uh, which is like an uh, older version of uh, UST uh, from Luna. Uh, so it is very like a uh, restricted area of uh, MEV execution uh, because like most other pairs uh, does not have significant MEV problem right now. That is the uh, uh, what data is telling us right now. So. Or maybe MEV problem is like overstated, uh, especially in Cosmos ecosystem, uh, where like uh, gas price is much cheaper and uh, uh, like the e DeFi is much smaller than Ethereum right now. So uh, I think uh, it is a little bit overstated. Uh, and in interchain uh, world, still MEV uh, can. Uh, be a tool for extracting value, but still, I I don't think it is uh, like preventing any core functionality or uh, creating significant economic uh, problem uh, yet. But I think uh, it is it is very sensitive within uh, very narrow uh, range of uh, applications such as like auction and uh, trading venues like DEXs. So. Uh, if uh, in those uh, application, I think it is better for our architect to build this uh, application uh, in a way that we can prevent this uh, uh, from start, so that we don't uh, create a solution uh, problem 
which does not need to exist. So I think that is uh, one of my uh, philosophy. Okay, yeah, um, definitely. Th thanks for expanding that. It makes sense to me. I think maybe, um, I guess you kind of touched upon it um, where you, you talked about a little bit about uh, UST uh, just now and that a lot of the MEV came from this. Now, obviously, that was a big um, event in the Cosmos wider ecosystem, the Luna Collapse. And as far as I understand, also Crescent had like Luna assets listed. Um, you know, maybe can you talk a little bit about how that impacted the uh, Crescent and, and maybe also the lesson, lessons you learned from that for Crescent as DAX, but also, yeah, maybe f the Cosmos SDK or in general, the ecosystem. Yeah, so uh, we we had a great lesson from this Luna crash. Uh, one of the biggest lesson is that uh, it is very dangerous for us to uh, decide any um, uh, canonical solution for any uh, DEX uh, related uh, liquidity or tokens or bridges or other solutions. Uh, because I think uh, in Cosmos especially, it is about variety and like robustness or resilience of the ecosystem. It means that a minor project should be respected enough uh, to provide this all this uh, connection for the users. So uh, our uh, it, philosophy has been strengthened uh, from this uh, in, uh, experience because even though the Luna was Uh, Terra was the one of the biggest ecosystem in Cosmos. It just vaporized within one one week. Uh, that is like how blockchain evolve. And even for current status, a very small project can rule the Cosmos within six months. That is also true. So we we are more humble right now. Uh, we we don't believe in uh, decision making like all this like. Uh, centralized into one solution and stuff. That is why we are providing incentive uh, for both bridges, uh, Axelor and Gravity Bridge, because we are not sure anymore. Uh, everything is humble, but still small projects should be respected within this like uh, variety of uh, ecosystem, uh, especially in Cosmos, that is the philosophy. So we believe that there should be lots of different stable coins Lots of different bridges, uh, lots of different liquid staking in one DEX. Uh, so like variety of choice will be our philosophy for Crescent. And we are going to pursue this philosophy to provide better, uh, more option to users. But I guess the, the downside of that being that, I mean, what's the argument? The other argument would be that now you're, you're fragmenting the liquidity and the users um, maybe are confused and, and don't really know what to use. Um, do you do you see that problem too, or uh, and, and if yes, I guess how do you address that? Yeah, so that is very interesting problem to solve. Uh, so, uh, like for example, if you have like uh, different kinds of stable coins, then uh, obviously the liquidity will be separated uh, within one dex. But still, the liquidity is connected each other. Uh, if you have like uh, IST versus USDC from Gravity and uh, USDC from Axelor and then uh, Dai from Gravity, uh, those like all of these like stable coins pairs are uh, connected each other. So if we have this like multi hop swap within feature, so which is coming very soon in Crescent, uh, we the liquidity is connected each other. So there will be like multiple routes you can take to have this best uh, swap price. Uh, so every liquidity is connected with these smart features. So if we can utilize these smart features uh, within uh, the DEX, uh, then uh, we can uh, connect all this liquidity so that users can utilize this liquidity. Uh, let me uh, have one example. So if you want to trade uh, A through to D token 
and you have like pairs with A with B and A with C and then uh, uh, B with D and C with D then you have two routes uh, A to B to D and A, A to C to D and then you can utilize uh, routing uh, through B or C to uh, be result in D. So actually, you are utilizing both liquidity. So if you are uh, if you are swapping large amount of liquidity, then you will separate this um, uh, amount of swap into two routes, uh, A B D and A C D. Then it is uh, just like uh, swapping. Uh, uh, a from uh, from A to uh, uh, B plus C combined to D, uh, that is like uh, exactly same result. So if the liquidity is connected each other very well, then uh, the separation is not the correlation. One one other thing we wanted to touch on, I guess this ties into what we talked about, uh, you know, in in the beginning. Uh, you know, the, the hackathon we did in Korea together, right, which was around liquid staking. Uh, I think back then there was like, you know, different different liquid staking ideas. You know, we had been working on this kind of delegation voucher idea uh, that, you know, we sort of also built on in Korea, but you had another a sort of other design for liquid staking. And, and of course, liquid staking is actually also one of the things that's, you know, built natively into Crescent. I'm actually... Not sure if anyone else has built uh, liquid staking, you know, I into the kind of base protocol like the way you guys have done. So can, can you talk a bit about like, you know, how does liquid staking work in Crescent? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, way back in like 2019, uh, I really enjoyed uh, like brainstorming with you guys, uh, talking about different uh, uh, ways to build this liquid staking problem uh, and uh, it was great uh, motivation for us to study further about this liquid staking area. So we were researching uh, different kinds of uh, solutions uh, but in our uh, Crescent uh, the solution is not very universal. This is uh, a restricted solution with some assumption which is uh, called a liquid staking validator. So we uh, assume that there, there is a white list validators uh, who are participating in liquid staking uh, activity and they will uh, separate the uh, delegation power evenly each other. So uh, in this assumption, liquid staking is much easier. Uh, uh, we just uh, distribute this all this power and then uh, when you undelegate, then you, you will just uh, undelegate uh, all this same power from all these uh, validators and give it back to you. So this is like very basic stuff. And also when you have enough staking rewards accumulated, then automatically in the end block, uh, the module will just re uh, withdraw this reward and restake. Uh, so this is uh, quite basic stuff. but. Uh, from this uh, innovation, uh, we, we have more interesting to come, which is called uh, liquid farming. So liquid farming is not very uh, uh, universal word right now. Uh, there's no much uh, application using these words or using this concept for uh, DeFi, but uh, it is increasingly uh, important uh, within this current uh, Cosmos ecosystem right now. So there are lots of capital locked inside uh, LPs. So uh, like uh, we, um, so users uh, are trying to reutilize this capital, but it is impossible for them to reutilize this capital for other pr uh, purposes. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, if there's a pool with Atom versus uh, Q Atom, which is coming from uh, Quicksilver, and there will be like farming rewards coming from Quicksilver and Crescent. So the APR will be quite uh, fruity, like maybe 30% uh, or 40%. And then the, the, the reserve tokens are just Atom and, and uh, Q Atom, right? And these are all Atom, actually. 
So uh, if you want to use it for like collateralized lending, then uh, you can receive all this farming and use it as a collateral to uh, lend some uh, stable coins. Uh, but if you use uh, collateral for Q Atom, then uh, the, the staking rewards is all you got. Uh, like farming rewards will be much higher. So uh, this will be a good solution for users to utilize uh, this like pool token uh, as a liquid uh, liquid farming solution. So this is will be like a minted token coming from uh, LP position, but auto compounding this uh, farming rewards. So liquid staking, liquid farming, uh, similar concept with different uh, uh, purpose or target to liquid liquidify. So uh, liquid farming is uh, liquefying the LP position. So um, uh, this is another concept we are uh, building. I think like there's uh, like like next month we are going to launch this. Okay, cool. So uh, to, just so I understand the the liquidity position because you just have um, there's not the range liquidity in in Crescent. So basically, you you every liquidity provider is the same. There is no the as long as you provide liquidity, they are fungible between each other, and then you you are able to use that and um is that actually a stable pool or how do you like i guess is it using the um, constant market the function is, is are, do you have different functions actually i guess we we didn't ask this in the thing but do you use uh, is it possible to kind of utilize different um curves in in crescent for let's say stable coins uh, versus, you know, just a constant product market, the one? Yeah, so the ranged LP feature is uh, just like Uniswap version 3, uh, utilizing constant product model. So this constant product uh, formula will be used for swapping uh, those two tokens uh, within a predefined price range. Uh, so uh, our uh, calculation is that when you provide uh, liquidity within 10% range, price range, then the leverage of, of liquidity will be uh, 40 times or about. So if you provide like um, 1 million liquidity for Q Adam versus Adam, uh, then it is equivalent to 40 million liquidity in osmosis. So this is uh, 40 times uh, capital efficient. Uh, so uh, yeah, that is how we uh, form this uh, ranged LP, which is completely different from the approach coming from Curve Finance. Uh, curve Finance is using a uh, different curve, but ranged LP is providing LP with the same uh, formula uh, used in Unisa version 2. Okay, so you predefine this range for this specific pool that's uh, done by the team essentially and uh that's how you achieve the fungibility i guess but i guess maybe that goes a bit into detail but i i'm wondering because i guess the q atom might accrue rewards as far as i understand do you have to change the the mid price there or the liquidity and and how would you do that yeah so like uh it, it should be manual uh right now so uh, like uh, we are going to provide like this is 10% is like very practical range of price uh, because uh, it uh, Qatom is accumulating about like uh, max 20% of APR right now. So in quarter, it will be like 5%. So 10% is like a wider enough uh, uh, range for this pair. So we create this uh, pair and then after one quarter, we uh, create another pair and then we distribute farming to this new pair. So uh, people will migrate this liquidity into this pool and we are going to provide a uh, front end uh, so that uh, with, with just one click, they can just migrate this uh, liquidity to new pool. So uh, this is like a manual process right now, uh, but uh, I, uh, there are uh, new uh, approaches from this like um, car finance uh, that uh, the the price can be automatically uh, the price range can be like automatically rearranged 
uh, from this oracle or like surprise uh, past surprises. So uh, we are uh, currently researching uh, ways how to mitigate this so that we don't need to like uh, constantly like uh, like uh, migrating this liquidity to new pools. Uh, so that is like one of our uh, roadmap. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe talking a bit about roadmap in general. Yeah, tell us like what what are the main you know the main milestones that are coming up for you know Crescent in the next you know two years. So uh, mm, uh, imminently, uh, like next month, we are going to launch uh, farming version two with uh, this uh, liquid farming feature. So uh, in farming version two, we allow uh, farming distribution uh, within uh, token pair, not token pools. So uh, because we have ranged pool uh, with one token pair, like like Adam versus B3, we will have multiple pools. Already we have multiple pools, but right now we are uh, we are uh, distributing the incentive. Uh, targeted to each pool right now. Uh, but uh, after farming version two, we are going to distribute this incentive into this token pair, Adam versus B3. And then uh, from this uh, liquidity uh, contribution from each pool is calculated automatically so that we can distribute these uh, rewards uh, in a very fair uh, computation so that we don't need to uh, decide uh, uh, farming rewards for each pool, but only for each pair. Then each pool will compete each other for uh, for the their liquidity providing. So that is how uh, Uniswap is doing right now. Uh, so Uniswap, if you see Uniswap, there's like two pool kind of pools: Ethereum versus Dai, uh, with like 0.3 percent commission fee and then 0.05% commission fee. And uh, uh, based on circumstances, the trade is executed uh, within these two pools and they are, these two pools are competing each other uh, to provide uh, optimized uh, liquidity for the users. So this is like same thing in farming version two. So now farming version two will uh, allow pools to compete each other for the best liquidity they can provide. So this is a uh, like imminent feature, and uh, we are going to launch also after swap, after batch swap, which allows multi hop swap. So like if you want to swap A, uh, routing to B, C, and then uh, to D, then this will be allow allowed uh, in our next upgrade. So uh, this is also in plan. Um, um, yeah, we have uh, several more um but that is i think like a most imminent upgrade uh right now um we are going to also launch like managed lp uh, uh, within i think like five months so uh managed lp will allow users to invest into uh lp fund so that they don't need to uh manage their position uh, but uh, delegate this to a professional fund manager so this will be also launched uh, early next year. Cool, very nice. Well, uh, thanks so much, Hyung, for coming on. It was really a pleasure to speak with you about, you know, Crescent and about AMMs and markets in crypto in general. I mean, this is obviously an area of, you know, enormous innovation, enormous speed of development. So. Um, I'm uh, really excited to speak with you about it. I think it's also becoming an area of great complexity, right? That's like getting hard. I guess like so many things in crypto, right? That's getting uh, harder to like wrap your head around it for sort of the, you know, the normal crypto person. So hopefully this was helpful also for, for listeners to like understand a little bit, like where is this all going? Uh, and, you know, how can people still participate? You know, so I'm excited that there's going to be this managed liquidity coming so that you know normal people can still uh, still participate in, in all of this and so yeah thanks so much i'm excited to see where crescent goes and where it goes next and you know hopefully we can have you on again at some point in the future to you know get an update about how things are going yeah 
Thank you for inviting me and looking forward to see you guys in Cosmoverse. Thank you, Hyung. See you soon. And thanks so much for our listeners for tuning in. If you uh, want to support the show, make sure to leave us an iTunes review. Let us know on Twitter what you think of the episode. Uh, share it. And thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.